back with another biography covering another Bolshevik. This time I am covering Nikolai Bukharin. He's an incredibly important figure in the history of the Bolsheviks and really communism as a whole. Lenin would say of him, Bukharin is not only the most valuable and major theorist of the party, he is also rightfully considered the favorite of the whole party. This despite many of their historical disagreements. Bukharin would be one of the main figures in party leadership in 1917 and remain a major figure until 1929. He'd retain some influence until 1938 when he was ordered to be executed that was personally authorized by Stalin. Despite all this, I do think he tends to be a lesser known figure within the Bolshevik party. Nikolai Ivanovich Bukharin was born October 9, 1888. Both of his parents were primary school teachers in Moscow. His father was a graduate of the Moscow University and was a t school teacher until 1893 when he became a tax collector. Four years later, he would lose this post and be unemployed for a few years, following leaving the family rather poor at the time. Both Bukharin's parents, being educated members of the intelligentsia, did mean Bukharin was raised very well educated for the time. He would finish primary school as one of the best students and would enroll in one of the best gymnasiums in Moscow. He would do exceedingly well there and without ex really putting much effort into his classes. From a young age, he was also quite adventurous and a curious kid. He took a strong interest in uh, creatures from tarantulas to birds. He even built a sort of small zoo as a kid. Uh, this interest never really went away with birds, which is, you know, honestly why I like Bukharin, because this might become as a bit of a surprise, but I like birds. Uh, I think they're interesting, and Bukharin liked birds too. <laughs> if you want to know a bit more about Bukharin's real life, his memoirs he produced while he was in prison um, are available. Bukharin, now 16 in the higher grades of the gymnasium, it was the year 1905, and he was swept up in the growing radicalism. He would be drawn to the center of much of the revolutionary activity in Moscow, the State University, and lecture hall students, workers, and revolutionaries would listen and make speeches. It was here Bukharin would be drawn to Bolshevism, as well as a lot of fellow revolutionaries from Moscow. This would have a profound impact on the Bolshevik party. This brought in many young faces but future leaders in the party, including Bukharin. There would be a group of Muscovites, of which Bukharin would be the most famous, formed a group of friends around Bukharin, and many of this would be his allies in various party struggles. This also shows an early example of one of Bukharin's major qualities he is known for, which is to be friendly and good-humored, and, well, apparently was also quite attractive to women. He was also likely pulled to the Bolsheviks in part due to their dominations in Moscow. It was one of the few locations where the Russian Empire where the Bolsheviks held majority over the local party committees. It's important to know that at this time the Bolshevik Mensheviks were both part of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, so a lot of party committees around the country were either controlled by either group or sometimes groups of people who were more in the middle. This would remain the case until 1910s when it the groups more properly separated. Also note on the term social democrats, in the context the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks would both be considered social democrats within Russia at this time. It'd be more some time before social democracy would pick up its modern definition. Anyway, back to Bukharin. After the year 1905 had passed and the meetings at the university had stopped, so did the demonstrations in the barricades. Bukharin in 1906 would formally join the Bolsheviks. His job within the party was to act as a propagandist. He would work alongside Grigory Sokolnikov, who in the future would be commissar of finance and member of the Bolshevik Central Committee in 1917. Sokolnikov and Bukharin would unify the Moscow youth groups and would hold a national congress of social democratic student groups in 1907. The congress of student groups would prove the program and the tactics of the Bolsheviks. The congress of student organizations would soon be destroyed due to police harassment. Not all of his work at this time was as a student. He would participate in industrial organizing and lead a strike of workers at a wallpaper factory. Bukharin would also in 1907 be enrolled in economics at the Moscow University, though with all of his party work, he really was hardly ever in class. This did not, however, mean that he had no interest in economics, and in fact, it would be Bukharin's primary interest later on. During this time, he was a part of organizing Marxist schools, student demonstrations, including raids, where a number of Bolsheviks would go to lecture from a liberal professor to attack and critique them. He would quickly rise through the ranks and by 1908 was part of the Moscow Party's central organization and would be ratified in 1909. This would make Bukharin a high-ranking Bolshevik in the largest city in Russia. Though, this would mean he quickly caught the attention of the Tsarist secret police, the Okhrana, and he would be arrested in May of 1909. Though released soon after, then arrested again, and then re released again under security pending trial. During this time, separate factions or groupings were forming within the Bolsheviks. I talked about this briefly within my video on Lunacharsky, but a group around Bogdanov was forming that was opposed to Bolshevik participation in the Duma, where Lenin was for it, as well as Bogdanov started supporting other philosophies and tried to merge them with Marxism. Lenin was deeply opposed to both positions. Lenin supported Bolshevik participation in the Duma, and Lenin wrote materialism and empirocriticism 
which was attacking Bogdanov. Bukharin, while he had agreed with Lenin, did not agree with Bogdanov politically. He did, however, admire Bogdanov, despite disagreeing with him. During this time, underground work became very difficult. Bukharin moved to doing more legal work during this time. He did eventually go into hiding in 1910, though, due to some secret informants, all the party leaders of Moscow were rounded up. Bukharin's hiding spot was not known to many people. He began to suspect Roman Malinovsky, a fellow high-ranking Bolshevik in Moscow. This would become more of an issue later on, but we'll talk about this later. When arrested, Bukharin was imprisoned in Moscow for six months. He was then exiled to Onega in June. Bukharin feared he would soon be moved to a penal colony, and he disappeared from Onega on August 30th and left Russia. Fleeing the country was a pretty normal thing for a lot of revolutionaries in Russia at this time. Outside Russia, Bukharin would go to Hanover, Germany, skipping meeting with Lenin, something that was really typical of Bolsheviks when exiled. Bukharin would eventually go to meet Lenin in September of 1912. He would meet Lenin for the first time. Their long conversation became focused on Roman Malinovsky, a person Bukharin suspected of being a police agent. During this time, Malinovsky had become a leading Bolshevik, and he was on the Central Committee and head of the Bolsheviks in the Duma. Bukharin was not alone of suspecting him of being a police agent. Many other Bolsheviks and Mensheviks suspected him of being a police agent, but Lenin would not hear of it, and it became a major, major source of friction between Bukharin and Lenin. Lenin, in an argument with Bukharin, would accuse him of being a gossip in 1916 due to proposing this idea. Though, with 1917 and the opening of the police records, it revealed to be true that Malinovsky was an agent for the Okhrana. Lenin would actually be put on trial of sorts by the Extraordinary Investigation Commission of the Provisional Government, and he would be questioned about why he refused to believe he could be a police agent. He expressed that the evidence was scant and unconvincing, and that Lenin was impressed by his trade union work. Bukharin would be invited to contribute to party papers, and Lenin was quite happy with his work despite the friction over Malinovsky. Bukharin's reason for moving to Vienna was to begin a project to criticize the works of bourgeois economists and a defense of orthodox Marxism. This work, The Economic Theory of the Leisure Class, published in 1914, would be Bukharin's this would be Bukharin's first book. The work the parts criticizing bourgeois economists took a lot from the works of the Marxist Rudolf Hilferding. And this was not the last work that he would take some influence from Hilferding. Both Lenin and Bukharin's writings on imperialism would be highly influenced by Hilferding. This is not the only thing Bukharin worked on during this time. In January of 1913, Bukharin would aid a Georgian Bolshevik sent to Vienna. Stalin at this time needed assistance not in the theory, but in the translations as Stalin did not know German. After this, Stalin would return to Russia and be arrested. I only mention this due to Stalin's location being betrayed by Roman Malinovsky. Also, just to finish this point, I really want to reinforce that Bukharin really only aided in the form of translation and possibly some other minor work. Stalin was the author of the work. Robert C. Tucker, in his book Stalin is a Revolutionary, explains the reasons why theories as to other authors or the idea of anybody else writing it with Stalin is wrong. Anyway, back to Bukharin. With the start of World War I, Bukharin would be deported and end up in Switzerland. While he was there, a few other Bolsheviks decided to publish a new newspaper. Leonard would become aware of this in January of 1915 and become quite angry with them, accusing them of starting an opposition newspaper. Bukharin explained that their paper was not an opposition but a supplement, but Lenin would not hear it. As well, in February and March, there was a party conference held in Bern. Here, Bukharin would find himself in disagreement with Lenin again on four points with regards to the party and war. Point one, he opposed the appeals to the petty bourgeoisie, this included the peasants, and opposed the idea of them becoming a revolutionary force or an ally. Point two, he wanted more emphasis on socialist demands. Point three, while they agreed with Lenin on turning the imperialist war into a civil war, they wanted more appeals to the general anti-war movement. And they did not think Russia's defeat would be a lesser evil, but felt all belligerents should be condemned. Point four. Lenin's call for a new international, they felt it should include all anti-war social democrats, the left-wing Mensheviks built around Leon Trotsky. There'd be some other uh, aspects where Bukharin would agree on the same issues as Lenin, and a commission would be made to work out the differences between Lenin, Zinoviev, and Bukharin. After some arguments, the final resolution was passed unanimously. So, while there were disagreements, Bukharin still found himself very much in broad agreement with Lenin. The arguments and disagreements, I think, are in part because I am sure, as all of you have experienced, it is sometimes the most frustrating to argue with someone rather close to your own opinion, but not quite, rather than someone who is very different. I think Lenin very much agreed with Bukharin on most things, and this made a lot of the smaller disagreements all the more frustrating to him. 
1915, Bukharin would also produce his work on imperialism that would have a large impact on Lenin, though his version would have some differences from Lenin. Uh, to talk about them in depth is really out of the scope of this video. Uh, Lenin read Bukharin's work and wrote an introduction for it, so what differences they are is really minor, and to get a feeling for them, you're really just going to have to go read both. Bukharin was also preparing a work on the Marxist theory of the state. This would result in an argument with Lenin, but this occurred a bit later, so we'll come back to that. Lenin over the course of the 1910s put more and more of a focus on colonialism and the problems of self-determination. Not to say it was not already a debate within the party, the fight against the Jewish bond by Lenin and Martov already contained some arguments on this matter, and the party congress in 1903 included provisions on self-determination and local self-rule, and Lenin had asked Stalin to prepare a response against the Austrian Marxists, where Lenin wrote, the right of nations to self-determination arguments primarily arose at Luxembourg, whose positions on the national question were piped popular amongst Bolsheviks. Um, I think it's important to worth mentioning that too, while s some of the Bolsheviks who were sympathetic to Rosa Luxemburg's positions actually went much further than her in opposing it, especially when it came to it in practice. Piatikov was a Russian sovinist, and this is really shown by his time in charge of Ukraine. Rosa still supported some local governments and the rights of language and culture. Karl Radek and others supported Luxembourg's position, and Bukharin came to as well. It's also not that Rosa didn't care uh, for what happened to these small nations, but that she felt language rights and local self-governance and equality for the law were sufficient when combined with socialism. She also felt the call for self-determination was a paraphrase of the old slogan of bourgeois nationalism, that the opposition and national oppression does not come from any special right of nations, but of the duty to oppose the class regime in every form of social inequality and social domination. This is the position that Bukharin would support, as well as a few other allies of his. Lenin would be rather outraged and would demand the journal Radek publish his views be in be abolished, and Lenin would ban their ability to communicate with Bolshevik sections in Russia. The Bolsheviks in the World War by Olga Gampkin, starting on page 219, has the thesis in English. Now, the actual thesis is nearly three pages wrong, long, and given this video is not about Bukhar and Piatkov's group position on it, I'm not going to read it on f in full, but hit on the major points. It is therefore impossible to struggle against enslavement of nations otherwise than by struggling against imperialism. Ergo by struggling against imperialism, ergo by struggling against finance capital, ergo against capitalism in general. Any deviation from that road and the advancement of partial tasks of the liberation of nations within the realm of capitalist civilization means the diverting of proletarian forces from the actual solution of the problem and their fusion with the forces of the corresponding national bourgeois groups. The slogan of self-determination of nations is first of all utopian, it cannot be realized within the limits of capitalism, and harmful as a slogan which disseminates illusions. In this respect, it does not differ at all from the slogans of the courts of arbitration, of disarmament, etc., which presuppose the possibility of so-called peaceful capitalism. To struggle against the shamanism of the working masses of a great power by means of the recognition of the right of nations for self-determination is equivalent to struggling against this shamanism by means of the recognition of the right of the oppressed fatherland to defend itself. Bukharin and other articles would also put forth that bringing up the working masses by this right to defend the fatherland would weaken the revolution, which is not dissimilar to the position Rose would put forth in the Russian Revolution when she was critical of the Bolsheviks on the national question. It is obvious that the phrases concerning self-determination and the entire nationalist movement, which at present constitute the greatest danger for international socialism, have experienced an extraordinary strengthening from the Russian Revolution and the Brest negotiations. We shall yet have to go into this platform thoroughly. The tragic fate of these phrases in the Russian Revolution, on the forms of which the Bolsheviks were themselves destined to be caught and bloodily scratched, must serve the international proletariat as a warning and a lesson. Uh, it is something I found interesting, but I am getting a little bit ahead of myself, but after the revolution, some Bolsheviks basically turned around on this slogan. Stalin is really a great example of this. In 1918, Stalin declared the slogan of self-determination was outmoded, and by 1920, the demand for the secession of the border regions from Russia must be rejected, not only because it runs counter to the very formulation of the question of establishing a union between the center and border regions, but primarily because it runs fundamentally counter to the interests of the masses of people in both the center and border regions. So, 
While Stalin was previously for it, he basically turned against it. And in practice, Bukharin ended up in some cases actually being quite defensive of oppressed groups. During the Georgian affair, the Russian Bolsheviks ended up in conflict against the Georgian Bolsheviks. A dying Lenin upset by the affair asked Trotsky to defend them at the 12th Congress. Well, Trotsky initially turned him down. He did actually end up attempting to defend them uh, during the preparations for the Congress. And in this, only Bukharin supported Trotsky defending them. When it came to the Congress, Bukharin was the only one to make a major defense of the Georgian Bolsheviks. He also declared that the national question was of prime importance to the Soviet state and that all questions at their root tied back to the national question, and there must be special concessions made to oppressed nations. This is after 1917, of course, but I found it interesting. Anyway, as well, during 1917 at the Seventh Party Congress, Pietkov tried to change the program and get the slogan of self-determination declared to be counter-revolutionary. Leno to work out a compromise position with Bukharin against Pietkov. Anyway, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself talking about things so much that happened much later. Let's get back to where we were in the timeline. 1916. <laughs> The differences would grow over 1916 between a lot of younger Bolsheviks who sided with Rosa and Bukharin and Radek's writings. Lenin declared their ideas have nothing in common, whether with Marxism or revolutionary social democracy. Now, this seems rather harsh, but I think this touches on what I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to quote directly from Cohen's biography of Bukharin, because I'm kind of having a hard time rephasing it, and I think it really puts this well. The leader's attitude confirms the impression that the closer men were to Lenin, the more bitterly he quarreled with them. For even during the worst periods in their relationships, furtive evidence of their underlying mutual affection now and then appeared. Bukharin occasionally tried to appeal to that feeling. He begged Lenin not to publish against me the kind of article that would make it impossible for me to answer cordially. I did not want and do not want a split. Lenin was not totally unperceptive. In April 1916, Bukharin was arrested in Stockholm for his participation in an anti-war socialist congress. Learning of his trouble, Lenin dispatched an urgent appeal for help. And later in April, after Bukharin had been deported to Oslo, Lenin wrote to another Bolshevik in Norway asking him to convey best regards to Bukharin. I hope from my heart that he will very soon take a rest and be well. How are his finances? The message was terse, but under the circumstances warm and even fatherly. Benighty was short-lived. By July, Lenin was explaining to Zinoviev that, I am not so ill-disposed towards Bukharin. I cannot write. In early 1916, Lenin requested for Bukharin an article on economics. However, he produced towards a theory of the imperialist state, sending it to Lenin to be published. This portion of the script got so long, I ended up turning into its own video. I'll summarize here, and you should go watch my video on Bukharin vs. Lenin on the Marxist theory of the state for it in full. Lenin initially considered publishing it as a discussion article, but he found it to be too incorrect on the question of the state. Now, without fully getting the history of this, Kautsky and many other prominent Marxists of this era had completely dropped any idea of smashing of the bourgeois state and the construction of a new worker state or the dictatorship of the proletariat. This was a product of them capitulating and becoming reformists, and so with that, they had to uphold the idea of just taking power from the bourgeois state. Bukharin was going against the most common Marxist understanding of the state and revolution at the time. Lenin felt Bukharin had taken angles out of context, and specifically his idea that anarchists and Marxists do not differ on the state as being very incorrect. Lenin even went as far as to accuse him of semi-anarchism, and he said that he was fully downplaying the need for a state post-revolution. However, Bukharin didn't ignore this. The proletariat destroys the state organization of the bourgeoisie, takes over its material framework, and creates its own temporary organization of state power. This debate would be carried out in letters, which, at least according to what I can find, have never been published, so we can't really take a look at those, unfortunately. This debate would act as a sort of catalyst for Lenin to take a deeper look at the state in the works of Marx and Engels. During this debate, Bukharin's mood was impacted and he fell into low spirits. Bukharin made his choice to take a steamer to America. This was at the recommendation of a friend and fellow Bolshevik, Alexander Shopnikov. Shopnikov told him he should go write for a newspaper Alexander Kolontai edited for in New York. When Lenin heard about this, he became deeply worried that he had driven Bukharin away. He inquired someone to find out with what mood Bukharin is leaving, and will he continue to write to Lenin and others, still filling requests for other documents. Lenin would then receive Bukharin's farewell letter, and I'm going to quote in the closing plea that Cohen includes from Bukharin's letter. I ask one thing of you, if you must polemicize, etc., preserve such a tone that it will not lead to a split. It would be very painful for me, painful beyond endurance, if joint work, even in the future, should become impossible. I have the greatest respect for you. I look upon you as my revolutionary teacher and love you. 
Lennon would respond saying that while the charges were valid, he gave Bukharin praise and said, we all value you highly. Bukharin would respond, be well, think kindly of me. I embrace you all. In December of 1916, Lennon would say he was working towards producing an article of his own on it. To do this, Lennon started gathering all the works in Marx and Engels he could and rereading it all. Lennon wrote and prepared a notebook from January and February. These notes would form the basis of what would become the state and revolution. Lennon, after examining the question, concluded that Kautsky was far more wrong than Bukharin, but he still felt that Bukharin was wrong in a few things. Then in May, Krupskaya told Bukharin that Lennon no longer had any differences with him on the question of the state. According to Cohen, it is possible in a letter through someone else Bukharin may have been aware of Lennon's shift in opinion earlier. In July, Lenin had to go into hiding and told Kamenev if the provisional government was able to kill him, that Kamenev was to publish the notes. Lenin managed to evade capture and turned his notes into the state and revolution while hiding in Finland. It was originally planned to be published in 1917, but the revolution put it on hold and was not to be published until January 1918. So, back to Bukharin. Bukharin in November of 1916 arrived in New York. In January of 1917, he became editor of a Russian-language newspaper. He also advocated and organized American socialists around the line of the Zimmerwald left. For information on the Zimmerwald left, see my Rosa Luxemburg video. Also in January, Leon Trotsky, also in the U.S., would join the editorial staff. A story that I think shows more of Bukharin's personal character comes from Trotsky and his, when his wife met Bukharin in New York. This is from Kenneth B. Ackerman's Trotsky in New York. Bukharin greeted us with a big bear hug, she wrote, added Trotsky. He welcomed us with a child exuberance characteristic of him. Bukharin had found something in New York City that he felt Trotsky, as Europe's foremost socialist writer, would surely appreciate. It wasn't the theater or the skyscrapers, not the subway or the cinema or the fancy stores. Instead, we had hardly got off board when he told us enthusiastically about a public library which stayed open late at night, which he had proposed to show us at once. Natalia recalled, at about 9 o'clock in the evening, we had to make the long journey to admire his great discovery. At Fifth Avenue, Bukharin led them around the corner until they stood in front of a great white marble building. An architectural marvel opened just a few years earlier, in 1911. Two white marble lions guarded the front entrance from either side. Overhead, etched in stone was the name of the New York Public Library. Bukharin knew Trotsky would adore this site. Bukharin took them inside and led them up the marble stairways to the building's top floor, and then through a small foyer into the library's main reading room. This, too, was magnificent, a vast open space, almost 300 feet long and 77 feet wide, larger than the entire ship on which they had just crossed the ocean, which ceilings painted and sculptures flooded with light, and books! The library's 75 miles of shells held more than a million of them, plus newspapers and magazines from around the world, for anyone, for free, to just come and read, till almost midnight, even on a Sunday night. I find this story, like, kind of cute, of the first thing that Bukhard wanted to show someone was the public library. Uh, Trotsky and Bukhard were to debate the direction the American Socialist Party should take, with Bukhard arguing for a split where Trotsky argued for staying and kicking out their reactionary elements. While they debated this, they maintained a warm friendship and politically collaborated on other issues. In March, Bukharin and the rest of the exiled Russians in New York would be made aware of the February Revolution and the abdication of the Tsar. Bukharin, like many, would immediately try to return to Russia. He set sail in April. He was detained first in Japan for a week and then by the local Menshevik government, and he only managed to reach Moscow by May. Bukharin's reaction in 1917. Now, I want to cover Bukharin's analysis of the Russian Revolution in 1917, so we can contrast with both Lenin and the positions of the Bolsheviks in Russia. This is from The Russian Revolution and Its Significance. This was published in June, but the positions are reflected in Bukharin's earlier work as well. Everything points to a compromise between the ruling classes. The revolution was not yet strong enough to overthrow the capitalist system. It has only affected a shifting of the elements within the bourgeoisie as a whole, has placed the more progressive wing at the helm by pushing aside the reactionary nobility. But the revolution is steadily growing. Even now, while these lines are being written, there exist in Petrograd two governments. One, that of the imperialist bourgeoisie, which was jubilantly greeted by the bourgeois classes of the other allied nations. The other, the governmental machine of the proletariat, the workingmen and soldiers' council. The struggle between the working class and the imperialists is now inevitable. Even the reforms that have been proclaimed by the provisional government were concessions made out of fear of the threats of the proletariat, but the liberal government will not be in a position to fulfill the program that has been forced upon it. 
but the conquest of political power by the proletariat will, under the existing circumstances, no longer mean a bourgeois revolution, in which the proletariat plays the role of the broom of history. The proletariat must henceforth lay a dictatorial hand upon production, and that is the beginning of the end of the capitalist system. A lasting victory of the Russian proletariat is, however, inconceivable without the support of the West European proletariat. Today, the bourgeoisie stands at its grave. It has become the citadel of reaction, and the proletariat has come to destroy its social order. The call to arms to this great upheaval is the Russian Revolution. Well may the ruling classes tremble before a communist revolution. The proletariat has nothing to lose but its chains, it has the world to gain. And now from Lenin, the dual power. The highly remarkable feature of our revolution is that it has brought about a dual power. This fact must be grasped first and foremost. Unless it is understood, we cannot advance. We must know how to supplement and amend old formulas, for example, those of Bolshevism. For while they have been found to be correct on the whole, their concrete realization has turned out to be different. Nobody previously thought or could have thought of a dual power. What is this dual power? Alongside the original government, the government of the bourgeoisie, another government has arisen. So far weak and insipient, but undoubtedly a government that actually exists and is growing, the Soviet workers and soldiers' deputies. Should the original government be overthrown immediately? My answer is one, it should be overthrown. For as an oligarchic bourgeois and not a people's government, it is unable to provide peace, bread, or full freedom. And from the April Thesis. The specific feature of the present situation in Russia is that the country is passing from the first stage of the revolution, which, owing to the insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletariat, placed power in the hands of the bourgeoisie, to its second stage, which must place power in the hands of the proletariat and the poorest sections of the peasants. So, both Bukhard and Lenin recognized the Soviets were a proletarian government and that it must defeat the provisional government, and this would be a proletarian socialist revolution. In March of 1917, Pravda was edited by Molotov, and the Bureau of the Central Committee remained under the control of Alexander Shopnikov. They advocated for no trust in provisional government and for a socialist revolution. Shopnikov held this position because he was the highest-ranking member in Petrograd, but not for long. Kamenev and Stalin would return, and they seized control of Pravda. Kamenev put forth more moderate proposals in the name of the Bolsheviks, and Shopnikov, not wanting to show any disunity in the party, decided not to fight him. The moderate wing of the party was now headed by Kamenev and Stalin, refused to print Lenin's letters from afar except for one, and deleted sections condemning the provisional government. As well, Stalin proposed reunification with the Mensheviks. Stalin as well as others felt there would be decades between the bourgeois revolution and the proletarian revolution. On April 6th, Kamenev, supported by Stalin, attacked the April Thesis, and on 8th, Kamenev and Pravda declared the April thesis was just Lenin's personal opinion. However, by late April, at the 7th All-Russian Conference of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, some of Lenin's proposals were accepted, though the right wing of the party managed to get a lot of their members on the Central Committee. However, many other Bolsheviks would oppose socialist revolution for months, and some even up until the October Revolution. It should be noted that Lars Lee rejects this description of events in his works, The Ironic Triumph of Old Bolshevism, and I read it in found it unconvincing but it might be something you want to give it a read if you want to hear an alternative theory on this but i really do think lars lee is wrong i also find bukharin's position of the liberal government will not be in a position to fulfill the program that has been forced upon it but the conquest of political power by the proletariat will under the existing circumstances no longer be in a bourgeois revolution in which the proletariat plays the role of the broom of history to really be it's really quite similar to Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, the idea that the bourgeois government cannot carry out its tasks and programs, so the revolution will go over into a proletarian one. Though, given Bukharin's later criticisms of permanent revolution, that might be a slightly controversial take. Bukharin back in Moscow. This was the background of which Bukharin was returning. While aside of Russia, him and Lenin had many disagreements, many of them gone due to Lenin coming over to Bukharin's position, such as the state, where they lost importance with the revolution. Lenin was primarily concerned with getting the party against the provisional government and supporting socialist revolution. Lenin, of course, was not alone in this struggle, and many new workers who had joined the party were very radical and did want the Soviets to take power. In 1915, Bukharin had called on Lenin to work with the anti-war Social Democrats built around Trotsky, and in a way, in 1917, Lenin would support this. In May, Lenin would offer Trotsky and his followers to join the Bolsheviks, and offer them leadership roles and editorial positions on Pravda. While he would not end up formally joining the Bolsheviks until the 6th Congress, and when the time came, it fell to Bukharin to welcome Trotsky and his followers to the party. 
As well as this occurring to the July days, Bukharin alongside Stalin delivered most of the Congress's main speeches, and Bukharin would join the Bolshevik Central Committee. Bukharin was one of the primary figures in the struggle to radicalize the Bolsheviks for the insurrection in Moscow. Most histories of the revolution tend to focus fully on Petrograd. Moscow was mostly ignored. I wanted to do a video on the events of Moscow during the October Revolution, but where there is tons of information on Petrograd, there is rather little on Moscow. This also means detailed information on what Bukharin was up to during this time is not as easy for me to get a hold of. Bukharin, with many of his friends, would take control of the party newspapers there, and with Bukharin on the editorial board, they became a strong voice for the revolution. This, combined with the efforts of many other Bolsheviks, won the local party members to revolution. On November 6th, the Moscow Soviet would begin organizing Red Guards while facing opposition from the Mensheviks and the SRs. The revolution in Moscow, unlike Petrograd, was not bloodless. The city Duma prepared a committee for public safety to counter the revolution. There was over a week of bloody street fighting, and on November 10th, the Junkers, alongside the Committee of Public Safety, seized the city rail railway stations, telephone stations, and surrounded the Kremlin. The commander of the Kremlin surrendered it on the promise his men would be spared. Then Brezhin, the commander of them, let the Junkers kill them. In the coming morning, the workers of the Kremlin arsenal were ordered to line up in the courtyard. I am quoting from the first-hand account Victor Serge includes in his Year One of the Russian Revolution. The men can still not believe that they are going to be shot like this, without trial, without sense. They have taken no part in the fighting. A command bellows out. In line now, eyes front. The men stand rigid, fingers along the seams of their trousers. At a signal, the din of the three machine guns blends with cries of terror, sobs, and death rattles. All those who are not mown down by the first shots dash towards the only exit, a little door behind them which had been left open. The machine guns carry on firing. In a few minutes, the doorway is blocked by a heap of men, lying there, screaming and bleeding into which the bullets still rain. The walls of the surrounding buildings are splattered with blood and bits of flesh. This was not the only mass execution carried out in Moscow during the fighting. The forces against the revolution carried out others. Eventually, though, the Military Revolutionary Committee in the Moscow Soviet would be victorious after nine days. The Committee of Public Safety surrendering on the condition that they be let free. And the Military Revolutionary Committee would honor this, and they were permitted to go free. And a direct quote again from Cohen's biography of Bukharin. The bloody fighting in Moscow, where 500 Bolsheviks alone died, compared to a total of only six people in Petrograd, may have already alerted Bukharin to the impending costs of revolution. Stukov later recalled their mood when he and Bukharin arrived in Petrograd to report on their victory. When I started to speak about the number of victims, something welled up in my throat and I stopped. I see Nikolai Ivanovich throwing himself in the chest of a bearded worker and they start to sob. People begin to cry. The real revolution had begun. And with that, we have covered Bukharin's life prior to the revolution, who would go on to do really a ton of things in the 1920s, which I fully plan to cover, however, in a separate video, in order to keep this from one from getting really excessively long, and this is already going to be about 35 minutes from the looks of it. Uh, the good news is I have like 80% of it written already, so it shouldn't be that long between this video and the next one. I also might do a separate video on just Bukharin and Trotsky in New York, given the impact they had on the American left. I hope you like it. Please subscribe for more content. Let me know if you like this attempt at doing a bit more visually with the videos as well as the audio. And please share it as well because YouTube algorithms really don't for me.